Today we'll be talking about wearable systems for monitoring physical activity and optimizing an exoskeleton. First, we'll talk a bit about mobility challenges that people face and some potential solutions to how we might improve them. Hundreds of millions of people face mobility challenges. And uh, this is for a variety of reasons. So it might be weight related, occupational challenges, for example, the firefighters you see here, people recovering from injury, or uh, people who have muscle weakness. And this affects many different patient populations, such as the elderly, uh, stroke survivors, people with MS and others. Fortunately, many people have been working on how to try and solve these mobility challenges. So clinicians like biomechanists, exercise physiologists, and engineers have developed many clinical tools to address these problems. And today we'll focus on three groups of solutions. So the first is physical activity monitoring, and this is helping to understand how much someone is exercising for applications like weight management. Second is assistive devices. So these are trying to either compensate for weak muscles or reduce the effort to walk for people who are able-bodied. The third here is I've listed as biomechanics analysis. And really what it means is we're gonna look at people's motion and try and perform some correction or rehabilitation to improve their mobility. So this could be, for example, people that have uh, knee pain from osteoarthritis could get some personalized gait corrections to try and reduce that pain. Uh, people could go through rehabilitation training um, and other sort of diagnosing musculoskeletal disorders. Unfortunately, clinical impact is limited to the patients that can reach the clinic, so people that live near the clinic, people who can afford it, and also people who have the time for multiple visits. So this is challenging because not everybody is able to access this uh, these benefits and see the results, and so we want to make something that's or improve this by providing tools which allow us to um, increase the number of people who can benefit from these solutions. So the goal here is make clinical solutions available at home with wearable systems. And so this is what my thesis, is, thesis work has been on, and we'll talk about uh, three specific applications. The first is wearable and accurate physical activity monitoring. Second is wearable optimization of an exoskeleton. And the third, which we'll just touch on briefly, is wearable and real-time motion capture. So the first we'll talk about is wearable physical activity monitoring. So this is essentially trying to track how many calories a person is burning throughout the day. We refer to this as energy expenditure. So energy expenditure is really the energy used by, consumed by the muscles to produce motion. So here we can look at kind of a system level equation of the human body where you breathe in oxygen, you have glucose stored in your body, you use these to produce a muscle activation, and then your body expels carbon dioxide and water. And so here we'll come to this point kind of throughout the talk that energy is expended by muscles to produce movement. And so when we think about the current methods for estimating energy expenditure, we see sort of a wide range of solutions. On one end of the spectrum, we have sort of a lab-based measure called respirometry. And this is a big mask that you wear and it measures the oxygen that you're breathing in and the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out. And it allows you to get a very accurate estimate of the energy you're expending, about 3% error. The, difficult, uh, the difficulty here is that it's annoying to wear a mask all day. Uh, the equipment is very expensive and because it gets one measurement per breath, it's quite slow. So if you want to have a good accurate estimate of how much energy someone's expending, you have to get several minutes of measurements. So this can be challenging in practice. On the other end of the spectrum, we have smartwatches and other smart devices. And so these, for example, are very popular, they're very low cost, so they're, they're low burden to use. But unfortunately, several studies have shown that they have a really high error in estimating energy expenditure. So they're not accurate enough for some of the tools that we'd like to try and provide weight management. In between these solutions, we have research devices, and we won't talk about these in depth, but basically they're different sets of sensors trying to improve accuracy, but also maintain um, 
portability, and they sort of fall along the line between the smartwatch and the respirometry system here. But what we'd really like to be able to do is to have sort of a new Pareto frontier where we have both low air and really low um, burden to wear the device. So sort of this star would be an ideal solution for us. So our hypothesis as we're trying to tackle this problem, estimating energy expenditure, is that leg motion relates to energy expenditure. Like we just talked about, muscles burn energy and create motion. And so if we look at that motion, we can probably understand more about how energy is expended. One thing that we'll use to kind of break down motion into something that we can really try and identify activity from is by looking at the gait cycle. So here, the gait cycle is the smallest periodic uh, motion during walking. So it starts when your foot hits the ground. So your heel strike, your foot is on the ground, which is called stance phase. And then you push off and then your leg swings. And right at the start of that second heel strike, that's the end of the gait cycle. So we'll look at motion through this, which is essentially a step with each leg as sort of a small unit of how we can try and understand how leg motion relates to energy expenditure. Earlier in my PhD, I looked at sort of a, a quick study using existing data sets to try and understand if this was a good method for breaking down motion to relate to energy expenditure. And the early tests seemed very promising. So we decided to kind of do a thorough set of experiments to really um, try and solve this challenge. So the goal of this project was to develop a wearable model of energy expenditure. And we broke this down into four experiments. The first is collecting data from many sensors. <clears throat> the second is selecting the most informative sensors, so trying to accurately estimate, but also have as few sensors as possible so it's both low cost and easy to wear. The third is train the model, which will estimate energy expenditure. You can see that we're passing in sensor data. We have a data-driven model, which we'll train, and we'll talk more about that later. And then that model estimates energy expenditure. And then the fourth step was to take this model and evaluate it with a new group of diverse um, participants. And here we mean physiologically diverse, so various range of age and weight to hopefully represent the adult US population. And here we get a good sense of how well this would work in practice if we were to deploy this like a smartwatch to many people. So we'll go through these uh, experiments step by step and kind of talk about the process. So first we collected data with many sensors. We had 14 participants where we strapped on all these sensors. So we used respirometry, which was that mask that we just talked about getting our ground truth energy expenditure measure. And then we collected four different wearable sensors, heart rate, electromyography, inertial measurements, and four sensing insoles. And these uh, heart rate you're probably familiar with, electromyography are basically surface mounted electrodes on the muscles, which measure muscle contractions. Then we had inertial measurements, which look at both the linear and rotational motion, and force sensing insoles in the shoes, which measure the vertical ground reaction force during walking. So once we had all these centers, sensors on participants, we had them complete a bunch of different conditions. And so this was to allow us to have enough data to try and understand how we could map the sensor to these respirometry measurements, which we'll talk about in a second. So now that we had all of this data, we wanted to select the most informative sensors. The first question that we'll have to ask is, how do we evaluate a set of sensors to determine if one is better than another? And the answer to that is with a linear regression model, which we called the data-driven model previously. So just a brief point about linear regression for those not familiar. It's a statistical tool where you model an input variable to an output variable. So here I have a toy example of providing an input of heart rate on the x-axis and you're estimating energy expenditure on the y-axis. So you can imagine these black dots are data points that we have recorded. So we had somebody wear respirometry to get an energy expenditure value and we had someone wear a heart rate monitor and that's how we get the heart rate reading. And now we're trying to map one to the other with a simple linear equation, AX plus B. And so we model this by using a line of best fit, which is shown in blue here. And this is our linear regression or our data-driven model is this blue line. 
And then to evaluate this model, we simply take a new point, which isn't in the points that we use to train our model, and we compute the error. So if we have a new point here, we can compute the difference between the actual energy expenditure uh, measured and the estimated from our model. And this error allows us to compute how well or bad this does. One important point, which we're touching on here is these black points we consider our training data. So it's some group of subjects and conditions. And we wanna evaluate our model with a separate group of subjects and conditions, which we'll call our test set. And so this is how we make an unbiased estimate of how well the model performs. In practice, since we're using many sensors, the model looks slightly different. Rather than just a single input from heart rate, we're gonna have inputs from many sensors. And you can think of it in this way, where you have incoming sensor data, which is split by gate cycle. So now we have sensor data from one step being passed into our model for as many sensors as we'd like to include. And we also use the subject's height and weight. This forms a vector x here, and we pass that into our linear regression model, still using the same y equals ax plus b. But now we have an a weight matrix, which is just a single vector. And we have x now, which is just a bunch of values for these different sensor signals, all in a single vector. And then this linear regression model still estimates just a single value for energy expenditure. If you didn't follow that, don't worry, it doesn't matter. So to select the most informative sensors, now we just look at the error of these models. So first we evaluated a model with all possible sensors and we found it to have about 11% error. And then we looked at all combinations of sensors and found that the best performing one was just using two IMUs. So one placed on the shank and the thigh. And these are the inertial measurement unit sensors that we talked about, which measure linear acceleration and rotation. And so this 14% error is quite good. And the system is very accessible. So these IMUs are low cost. They're about 10 to $20. They're low power and they're very common. And there's actually companies now developing pants or clothing with these already embedded in them. So you don't have to worry about trying to wrangle your own device. So you can imagine soon you might go outside to run in your Nike shorts or whatever, and they'd have these sensors already embedded in there and they'd be able to talk to your phone and provide really accurate estimates of energy expenditure. So the next step is to make a prototype of this system so we could evaluate it with additional experiments. And this is what our prototype looked like. We have the two IMUs on the shank and the thigh. And then we have a little microcontroller which acts as a mini computer. And this is where we load our data-driven model to take measurements from the IMUs and produce estimates of energy expenditure. And then of course we have a little battery. So the last step here was to finalize the model that we'd put with the wearable system. So this data-driven model, we decided that we'd like to collect some additional data for other activities that we hadn't already collected. For this model, we targeted walking, running, stair climbing, and biking. So we collected data from 13 participants doing various conditions of these activities. We picked these because they are very pervasive, so they're common, and they're high energy expenditure. So if we can estimate these accurately, we can have a good idea of the total energy that people are expending throughout the day. And this is really the goal, to have a, a good physical activity month. So once we collected all the training data, we did the same procedure as we talked about before. We passed the sensor data into the data-driven model to get our FIT model, which we can use to estimate energy expenditure. Now that we have our prototype and our finalized model, what we're gonna do next is use that with a new group of diverse participants to evaluate how well it performs in practice. So we had these new participants uh, perform the same activities. They perform different conditions. You can think of different speeds of walking or running to make it more challenging. And you can see a distribution of their body mass index and age on this plot. And so we tried to make this a good representation of the adult US population. It's slightly lower in average age and I think slightly lower in body mass index, but it's uh, fairly diverse, which is a good, gives us a good initial sense of how well it would do on a broader population. So now we'll look at some results of how well the wearable system performed. 
first we tested it on steady state energy expenditure. So we had participants walk and then stand and run and stand and uh, perform all these conditions followed by a standing condition. And here they've, they're performing the condition for about six minutes and then resting for three minutes. During this time, we're measuring respirometry as our ground truth. And you can see the steady state value here in black is what we're treating as our ground truth for how much people are, uh, how, many, how much energy people are expending at any given point in time. This plot's pretty complicated. So there are a couple things that you should notice. The first is the wearable system shown in blue accurately follows this steady state estimate as a function of time. The next thing to notice is the methods that we compare against, including the heart rate model, smartwatch, and activity specific smartwatch have large errors across many conditions. You can see here, there's just a large offset compared to the ground truth. Again, here, here. There's also a feature that you'll notice where at the beginning of conditions, the methods that we're comparing against take a long time to reach a steady state estimate between one and two minutes. And then again, at the end of the condition, when people begin to rest, you'll notice that there's a, a while before the estimates reach a steady state resting rate. And this is because these other models, rather than using leg motion to infer energy expenditure, they're relying on things like heart rate and wrist motion. And so heart rate, you would think it relates uh, closely to energy expenditure, but unfortunately it's quite variable. So it's hard to track it day to day or hour to hour. Things like fatigue change it significantly and also coffee, uh, so caffeine, whether people have eaten, uh, if people are overtired. So it's, it makes it essentially too noisy to accurately get a good estimate of energy expenditure. It also causes these significant delays. You can think of these delays as being due to um, when you start running, you actually don't start breathing hard for the first 30 to 40 seconds. And this is because you have um, some oxygen and glucose stored in your muscles already. And the way in which your body replaces those is quite complicated and causes significant delays. So the wearable system seems to have a good way of tracking by doing these estimates once per step and looking at leg motion, the instantaneous energy that people are expending at any point in time. To kind of quantify how well it performs overall, we look at an absolute error measure here, which is about 14%, I think, for the wearable system. And the next best comparison was the activity-specific smartwatch, which had about three times more error. So in terms of estimating the total cumulative energy expended, uh, the wearable system performs really well, which is exciting. Because our model did so good, at quickly estimating energy expenditure from the start of the condition to the end of the condition, we wanted to test how it performed during time varying conditions. You can imagine here the person is quietly standing and then switches to walking and then back to quietly standing. And they repeat this many times in a row. The ground truth energy expenditure when they're standing is shown here and then when they're walking is shown here. And this is important to be able to capture because about 40% of the steps we take each day are in short bouts of walking of 20 steps or less. So 40% of the total steps we take are in these short bouts. We want to be able to accurately estimate energy expenditure for those bouts in order to understand how much uh, we're using throughout the day. So again, you can see that the wearable system really accurately tracks those short bouts, which is quite exciting. And this is due to the fact that we're estimating once per step and looking directly at leg motion. So as soon as somebody start, starts walking, uh, we have a good idea of how much energy they're expending. The other methods show little to no fluctuation, which based on heart rate makes sense because it, there's a 30 to 40 second delay. And so if you're just walking for say 12 seconds here, uh, these methods really won't pick up any change. We evaluated a couple other time varying cases such as changing walking speed, changing from walk to run, and sinusoidally varying walk to run. And in all these cases, you saw that the wearable system really accurately tracked these changes uh, despite really rapid changes from walking to running. 
Here you'll notice that most of the other methods show little to no fluctuation, except for the activity specific smartwatch. And because of the delays, it's sort of out of phase. So it doesn't help you understand how much energy you're expending at a given point in time, and also doesn't quite capture the magnitude of the change between the two extremes. Next, you get to see the wearable system in action. So here we have a participant wearing the system. And you'll see that as they take each step, you'll see a new energy expenditure point appear on the right. And as they transition between activities like walk to run here, you'll see a large change in energy expenditure value. And the system really quickly captures that change. And so this kind of illustrates the point that we've talked about. We've been talking about before where uh, looking at relating this leg motion to energy expenditure is quite effective. So we've sort of added a new tool on the spectrum of physical activity monitoring solutions. So like we talked about before, um, we'd like something that's pretty low burden and low air. And so here, this is slightly higher air than respirometry and probably a little bit more difficult to wear than a single smartwatch. But we think this could be uh, a really compelling and useful system for um, applications that we talked about before, like weight management, uh, better athletic training, and also relating exercise to health outcomes. So for example, it's important to know how short bouts of walking improve our health because this is how national policies make recommendations for how much activity we should get every day. But it's hard to know how much exercise you're doing if you don't have a good way of tracking it. So then it's hard, it's even harder to relate to health outcomes if you don't know how much exercise people are performing. So this could help with that. So in a similar vein, we took this idea of using motion to estimate energy expenditure. And we applied it to another topic, which is wearable optimization of an exoskeleton. So here by optimization, we mean trying to customize how the device is assisting the person. And exoskeleton, you might be thinking something like Iron Man, but really it's uh, best illustrated in this picture here. It's essentially the device we'll be talking about today is an ankle exoskeleton which helps apply torque to the ankle joint. These devices come in many shapes and sizes, uh, but we'll be focusing on this design today. I have a little prototype. If we were in person, I would have uh, liked to wear it and demo it for you, but hopefully I can show you the basic principle. The idea is that you wear this on your leg and by applying some force to the cable, you can actuate the foot and provide a push off assistance. We'll be talking less about the design and more about how we optimize it. But hopefully this illustration um, provides some information about the device. So the goal of these exoskeletons is to improve mobility. So you can wear this system on your leg, essentially attached to your shoe and your calf, and it applies torque about the ankle. And what we're trying to do here, and what generally we try to do with exoskeletons, is target some mobility metric to improve. So today we'll be talking about trying to reduce energy expenditure or metabolic cost, and that's to say, make it easier to walk. You could also try and increase walking speed or improve stability if that was important for certain populations. But the trick is that it's really challenging to effectively assist people. So there have been hundreds of designs that have failed to provide any benefit. And really only in the last decade or so have we seen any systems which can improve any of these metrics for the user. This is due to a couple factors. So one is improved technology. So we have better motors and batteries. Another is we've started to think about how to really tune the assistance for a person and customizing this assistance provides a really significant improvement to these benefits. So here you can uh, get a picture of the ankle exoskeleton. And when we talk about how it's assisting people, we're talking about uh, sort of a torque profile throughout the gait cycle. So before we were talking about leg motion and through one step, you can think of how this person uh, has torque applied by basically their heel strikes the ground here. Their foot is slowly starting to turn to push off. We start applying torque. We apply the peak torque as 
the person is pushing off, and then we ramp down the torque before the person's foot leaves the ground. And then we apply no torque as the leg goes into swing. And so we define this single curve of assistance with a couple parameters. And then what we're going to try and do is tweak these four parameters to provide assistance which is best for any particular user. Here you can see a participant walking with the exoskeletons. Right now, uh, the assistance provided is very significant, uh, but it looks like their motion is quite normal. And this is because this profile has been, or these assistance parameters have been uh, optimized for this person. And what we'll talk about next is how we try to actually perform this personalization. So you can think of the human and the device as a feedback loop. So the human's wearing the exoskeleton and the human's motion is measured by the exoskeleton. And then the exoskeleton applies torque to the person. And so we have a little loop here as the person and the device operate together. Now, if we're gonna try and change how the device is operating to assist the human in the best way, we're gonna to need to take a measure of whatever we care about. Here, we'll use that respirometry mask again to understand the energy that the person is expending while walking. And we'll pass that to an optimizer, which is gonna pick our device parameters. So yeah, the idea is that the person wears the device and walks, and then we measure how easy or hard it is for the person to walk. And then we try different profiles and we see how easy or hard each one is. And over time, we improve uh, the assistance and make it easier for the person to walk. So this optimization has shown really big benefits. And so this is a idea that was presented in Steve Collins lab a couple of years ago and has been quite revolutionary in this field and others where if we're trying to assist someone, why don't we just directly optimize for the thing we care about, which in this case is metabolic cost or the energy that they're expending while walking. And so this previous work showed that just with one exoskeleton on one leg, we could find a 24% energy reduction compared to the exo turned off. Which is really cool. So now, as we talked about before, respirometry is not really feasible to use every day. So we're going to try and replace this respirometry measurement with a data-driven model, which relates motion to energy expenditure. As you remember, respirometry takes several minutes to, to uh, get a good measurement. So this experiment to optimize an exoskeleton actually took about two hours. Uh, which is a long time to be walking on a treadmill at one fixed speed. So really what we'd like is a way to do this, not using respirometry so we can take it outside of the lab. And you can imagine a person gets an exoskeleton, which can uh, use some wearable sensors to perform this optimization. And then as they go about their daily life, we can tweak assistance and help them walk better. In addition, we'd like to make it so that person has to walk less for it to optimize so that it optimizes more quickly. And we'd also like to not force the person to walk for two hours straight. So if the system could ideally um, work based on those short bouts of walking that we talked about, that would be great. So sort of our overall goal is to develop a wearable model to optimize exoskeletons. And we'll break this down into several sort of experimental steps like we did before. So the first step is to collect data so that we can try and learn this relationship between motion and energy expenditure. Fortunately for us, uh, Katie Pogginsey and Steve Collins lab recently published a really cool paper and it had a bunch of data of people walking in exoskeletons. And so we we're able to just use that data and avoid that step. The second is to train our model. So like before, we're gonna input some sensor data. Here, it'll be exoskeleton specific sensor data consisting of ankle angle, velocity and torque. And we'll pass that into our data-driven model. Notice that we're not going to estimate energy expenditure this time, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. We're going to do something slightly different. The third step is to optimize this assistance for new participants and make sure it works in practice. So we take this data-driven model, we put it into this optimization loop, and we see if using this model allows people to see the same reduction in energy expenditure as they're walking. So it provides the same benefit. And a hypothesis here is 
Specifically, ankle motion relates to energy expenditure, since that's what we'll be measuring and trying to relate. The problem is that many conditions when walking in an exoskeleton have very similar movements. So before we talked about mapping kind of gross motions of walking or running to energy expenditure, but now we're gonna have the same participant walk on a treadmill at a fixed speed, and we're just gonna slightly change how we're applying assistance to the exoskeleton. And we wanna understand how the changes in their motion correspond to changes in the energy it takes them to walk. So now these very slight changes in motion are going to play a big role in the changes in energy expenditure. The solution for how to overcome this is we're actually going to compare the two conditions. So you can imagine we have two torque profiles that are very similar. We're going to apply each to the person and record their motion. And then we're going to focus on the difference in their motion for each profile. So now we're going to look at how the difference in the motion relates to the difference in energy expenditure. And the, the major uh, point here is that rather than directly estimating a value for energy expenditure, we're gonna just use a classification model and say, based on these differences, is condition one better than condition two? And this really simplifies our problem so that we can try and understand how these small changes impact the metabolic cost. We're then gonna repeat this for all pairs of conditions and rank which conditions we find best. And that's how we'll ultimately select personalized assistance for a person. You can think of this as taking condition and condition one and condition two, subtracting their motion data and passing the difference into the data-driven model, which is going to then just pick the best. So to experimentally evaluate this, we use a lab-based exoskeleton setup, which you kind of saw the person walking in before in that video. And this picture here shows an exoskeleton on one leg, but actually we'll have participants wear them on both legs. And they'll perform a protocol where they first use a respirometry to select assistance parameters for a person, which we call metabolic optimization. So they'll go through the two hours of walking using the mask, optimize the parameters and keep note of those. Next, we'll go through the same procedure using the data-driven model. <clears throat> So once we have these data-driven optimized parameters, we can compare them to the metabolic parameters and decide how well they work in practice. <clears throat> what we found during a normal walking trial, <clears throat> sorry, is that the data-driven model is as effective as respirometry. So this is really surprising. We have a data-driven model using some sensors on the exoskeleton and it relates the motion as accurately as having a direct measure. We find that it performs better than a generic assistance profile. Sorry, one second. Okay, um, we find that it performs better than a generic assistance profile which is the parameters optimized for other users and significantly better than normal shoes or zero impedance, which is the exoskeleton turned off. So it provides a net benefit of about 43% compared to the exoskeleton turned off, which is quite amazing. And uh, this could really benefit population groups that have difficulty getting around. So here we test with able-bodied people, but we hope that this extends to other population groups as well. Uh, this indicates something really interesting, and that's that our model has learned a relationship between ankle motion and energy expenditure, which is very accurate and works for several participants. Um, in addition, data-driven optimization requires about four times less time than the respirometry used in metabolic optimization. And so now you can imagine that you can achieve the same benefit with 30 minutes of walking rather than two hours of walking. For practical purposes, it's much easier to implement because our data-driven model actually only requires 30 seconds versus several minutes of measurements 
for a single condition. And so you could imagine as you walk for a short bout of walking, we could use that information in our optimization procedure. To understand how this model is relating ankle, um, ankle motion to energy expenditure, we can look at the underlying weights in the system. This is pretty complicated. So rather than have you kind of stare at the screen and try to interpret these colors, I'll just tell you on a, a high level what it's trying to do. And it's basically has two competing interests. One is that it would like to have a really large range of ankle angle. So it'd like your ankle to both have uh, to push off and just go through a very large range of motion, but it would like it to do it at a slow velocity. So really slow and smooth rate. So these are sort of competing because you want to push off and have a large range of motion so that you provide good push off assistance, but you also want to do it slowly to make sure you're not injuring the person that they're stable. Um, and so the model is sort of balancing these two things and the way in which it balances it seems to be very accurate for selecting parameters for different users. Now that we've talked about us optimizing for one normal walking speed, we'd ideally like this model to extend to other speeds uh, so that you could use it for normal activity, which is you know changing speed, slowing up, slowing down, uh, starting and stopping. So here you can see me uh, walking very slowly in a sloth costume. And we perform some additional experiments with three participants where we optimize their walking for slow walking, fast walking, and incline walking. Across all of these experiments, we found that the data-driven model works uh, well and it performs about the same as metabolic optimization. You'll notice that the relative savings depends on the conditions. So for example, slow walking, we see only a 23% saving versus other conditions we see higher. Um, and this is just because the body is producing more or less work. And so you can kind of augment the body only to the amount that it's uh, injecting work into the system. So the fact that we're able to optimize well across many different conditions indicates that our model has learned a relationship between ankle motion and energy expenditure that generalizes. So there's something fundamental that it's, it's found out about how that ankle motion relates to energy expenditure and how people walk. Um, it's also nice that we can use the same model to optimize many different conditions. So like we talked about before, we needed training data to be able to create this model. And it would be quite annoying if we had to collect data for each of these different conditions. So it's great that the same model performs well across a bunch of different um, modes of walking. Now that we have been able to optimize many different speeds for these participants, we can start to think about how might we assist someone who is walking in sort of an everyday routine where they're changing speed and starting and stopping. Because previously exoskeleton research has really been just on in a lab setting on a treadmill at one fixed speed. And the way that we tested this was we took the optimized parameters at three different speeds. And as we had a participant change speed on a treadmill, we just slowly changed the parameters as a function of speed. And you can see the participant here walking as the treadmill slows down. And you'll notice that the motion seems smooth and normal and kind of interpolating between these optimal parameters seems to be very effective. And we found that when we compared the energy that was expended, uh, this method worked well and, and showed a larger decrease in energy expenditure compared to just using one single fixed condition across speeds or fixed set of parameters across speeds. So we've made some strides to make exoskeleton optimization wearable. And um, to do that, we need some data to relate ankle kinematics, the metabolic cost, like we've talked about. And the models that result from that seem to perform as well as metabolic optimization across many conditions. So like we talked about before, this is 
exciting that we have a system now which is portable and can optimize during different speeds of walking. It's also very fast in comparison to respirometry. And so we think this could be effective in allowing us to take exoskeletons from the lab outside and customize to users. And so this is um, what I'm hoping to do to wrap up this study is to optimize during free living. And what that means is as people do bouts of walking during their daily life, we optimize the assistance and we try and see if we can actually provide this same benefit. So a large reduction in energy expenditure um, using a fully portable system. And so this would be a good test of how it applied to the real world. And then from there, we could try and assist or extend this to assist the elderly or other patient populations who might uh, really need these devices to get around. The last point we'll talk about today, just very briefly, is wearable and real-time motion capture. So early on, we talked about how biomechanics analyses, for example, trying to um, provide gait corrections or rehabilitation for injuries, require you to look at people's motion. And so this part of my work was developing a wearable system that allowed you to capture people's motion. So on the left, you can see me moving. And then on the right, you can see a reconstruction of my motion. You'll notice that there's a little pack on my back, which contains a little microcontroller like we talked about before. And I'm wearing IMUs on the different parts of my body, which allow me to reconstruct the motion. There are several commercial and uh, research systems which do this. The main differences between my system and theirs is um, mine's designed to be open source. So hopefully it's rec replicable and other researchers can use it. And we've tried to make it very low cost. We validated the accuracy and we uh, looked at how it would operate in some example use cases to make it uh, sort of a benchmark for other people to build on top of. Next, I'd like to just really briefly mention two projects that I worked on, um, not as part of my thesis work, but that were really fun. So the first is Stanford Doggo. And this is a project that I worked on with the Student Robotics Club. Don't know why the video is not playing, that's a bummer. Oh, there we go. And this was with uh, Nathan, Aaron, and Natalie. And what we saw was we can build a cool little robotic platform that is quite mobile and can perform some really athletic maneuvers. To me, this was a really fun project because I got to take on a little bit more of a mentorship role and um, they're all so smart and excited about this project. They really made Doggo come to life and it was just super fun to work with them and, and see the cool things that Doggo could do. Uh, another project I worked on was the augmented cane. And this is essentially a intelligent walking stick for people with impaired vision. So you can imagine here's the walking stick and then we applied some sensors to the top and a little motor to the bottom and it helped steer the participant. And this was with Arjun and he um, helped me develop the system. And it was very interesting to learn about this particular mobility challenge of getting around without vision. And you can see him here navigating a course using the sensors. Oops. And uh, so that was also a really fun project and something that I really enjoyed working on. So we talked about um, projects today related to my thesis, which are shown here in uh, the darker color. And I worked on some other projects like Doggo, which we talked about, which are not part of my thesis, but are kind of faded here.